THE HOUSE OF A THOUSAND CANDLES BY MEREDITH NICHOLSON CHAPTER Ten, AN AFFAIR WITH THE CARETAKER I read in the library until late, hearing the howl of the wind outside with satisfaction in the warmth and comfort of the great room. Bates brought in some sandwiches and a bottle of ale at midnight. "'If there's nothing more, sir?' "'That is all, Bates.' And he went off sedately to his own quarters. I was restless and in no mood for bed, and mourned the lack of variety in my grandfather's library. I moved about from shelf to shelf, taking down one book after another, and while thus engaged came upon a series of large volumes extra illustrated in watercolors of unusual beauty. They occupied a lower shelf, and I sprawled on the floor like a boy with a new picture book in my absorption, piling the great volumes about me. They were on related subjects pertaining to the French chateau. In the last volume I found a sheet of white note paper no larger than my hand, a forgotten bookmark, I assumed, and half crumpled it in my fingers before I noticed the lines of a pencil sketch on one side of it. I carried it to the table and spread it out. It was not the bit of idle penciling it had appeared to be at first sight. A scale had evidently been followed, and the lines drawn with a ruler. With such trifles my grandfather had no doubt amused himself. There was a long corridor indicated, but of this I could make nothing. I studied it for several minutes, thinking it might have been a tentative sketch of some part of the house. In turning it about under the candelabrum, I saw that in several places the glaze had been rubbed from the paper by an eraser, and this piqued my curiosity. I brought a magnifying glass to bear upon the sketch. The drawing had been made with a hard pencil, and the eraser had removed the lead, but a well-defined imprint remained. I was able to make out the letters N, W, three-quarter, to C, a reference clearly enough to points of the compass and a distance. The word ravine was scrawled over a rough outline of a doorway or opening of some sort, and then the phrase, the door of bewilderment. Now I am rather an imaginative person. That is why engineering captured my fancy. It was through his trying to make an architect, a person who quarrels with women about their kitchen sinks, of a boy who wanted to be an engineer, that my grandfather and I failed to hit it off. From boyhood I have never seen a great bridge or watched a locomotive climb a difficult hillside without a thrill, and a lighthouse still seems to me quite the finest monument a man can build for himself. My grandfather's devotion to old churches and medieval houses always struck me as trifling and unworthy of a grown man, and fate was busy with my affairs that night, for, instead of lighting my pipe with the little sketch, I was strangely impelled to study it seriously. I drew for myself rough outlines of the interior of Glenarm House, as it had appeared to me, and then I tried to reconcile the little sketch with every part of it. The door of bewilderment was the charm that held me. The phrase was in itself a lure. The man who had built a preposterous house in the woods of Indiana, and called it the House of a Thousand Candles, was quite capable of other whims, and as I bent over this scrap of paper in the candle-lighted library, it occurred to me that possibly I had not done justice to my grandfather's genius. My curiosity was thoroughly aroused as to the hidden corners of the queer old house, round which the wind shrieked tormentingly. I went to my room, put on my corduroy coat for its greater warmth in going through the cold halls, took a candle, and went below. One o'clock in the morning is not the most cheering hour for exploring the dark recesses of a strange house, but I had resolved to have a look at the ravine opening and determine, if possible, whether it bore any relation to the door of bewilderment. All was quiet in the great cellar. Only here and there an area window rattled dolorously. I carried a tape line with me and made measurements of the length and depth of the corridor and of the chambers that were set off from it. These figures I entered in my notebook for further use and sat down on an empty nail keg to reflect. The place was certainly substantial. The candle at my feet burned steadily, with no hint of a draught. But I saw no solution of my problem. All the doors along the corridor were open, or yielded readily to my hand. I was losing sleep for nothing. My grandfather's sketch was meaningless. And I rose and picked up my candle, yawning. Then a curious thing happened. The candle, whose thin flame had risen unwaveringly, sputtered, and went out, as a sudden gust swept the corridor. I had left nothing open behind me, and the outer doors of the house were always locked and barred, but some one had gained ingress to the cellar by an opening of which I knew nothing. I faced the stairway that led up to the back hall of the house, when, to my astonishment, 
steps sounded behind me, and turning, I saw coming toward me a man carrying a lantern. I marked his careless step. He was undoubtedly on familiar ground. As I watched him, he paused, lifted the lantern to a level with his eyes, and began sounding the wall with a hammer. Here, undoubtedly, was my friend Morgan, again. There was the same periodicity in the beat on the wall that I had heard in my own rooms. He began at the top, and went methodically to the floor. I leaned against the wall where I stood, and watched the lantern slowly coming toward me. The small revolver with which I had fired at his flying figure in the wood was in my pocket. It was just as well to have it out with the fellow now. My chances were as good as his, though I confess I did not relish the thought of being found dead the next morning in the cellar of my own house. It pleased my humor to let him approach in this way, unconscious that he was watched, until I should thrust my pistol into his face. His arms grew tired when he was about ten feet from me, and he dropped the lantern and hammer to his side, and swore under his breath impatiently. Then he began again, with greater zeal. As he came nearer, I studied his face in the lantern's light with interest. His hat was thrust back, and I could see his jaw hard set under his blond beard. He took a step nearer, ran his eyes over the wall, and resumed his tapping. The ceiling was something less than eight feet, and he began at the top. In settling himself for the new series of strokes, he swayed toward me slightly, and I could hear his hard breathing. I was deliberating how best to throw myself upon him, but as I wavered, he stepped back, swore at his ill luck, and flung the hammer to the ground. "'Thanks!' I shouted, leaping forward and snatching the lantern. "'Stand just where you are!' With the revolver in my right hand and the lantern held high in my left, I enjoyed his utter consternation, as my voice roared in the corridor. "'It's too bad we meet under such strange circumstances, Morgan,' I said. "'I'd begun to miss you. But I suppose you've been sleeping in the daytime to gather strength for your night prowling.' "'You're a fool,' he growled. He was recovering from his fright. I knew it by the gleam of his teeth in his yellow beard. His eyes, too, were moving restlessly about. He undoubtedly knew the house better than I did, and was considering the best means of escape. I did not know what to do with him now that I had him at the point of a pistol, and in my ignorance of his motives and my vague surmise as to the agency back of him, I was filled with uncertainty. "'You needn't hold that thing quite so near,' he said, staring at me coolly. "'I'm glad it annoys you, Morgan,' I said. "'It may help you to answer some questions I'm going to put to you.' "'So you want information, do you, Mr. Glenarm? I should think it would be beneath the dignity of a great man like you to ask a poor devil like me for help.' "'We're not talking of dignity,' I said. "'I want you to tell me how you got in here.' He laughed. <laughs> "'You're a very shrewd one, Mr. Glenarm. I came in by the kitchen window, if you must know. I got in before your solemn jack-of-all-trades locked up, and I walked down to the end of the passage there.' He indicated the direction with a slight jerk of his head and slept until it was time to go to work. You can see how easy it was. I laughed now at the sheer assurance of the fellow. If you can't lie better than that, you needn't try again. Face about now, and march. I put new energy into my tone, and he turned and walked before me down the corridor in the direction from which he had come. We were, I dare say, a pretty pair, he tramping doggedly before me, I following at his heels with his lantern and my pistol. The situation had played prettily into my hands, and I had every intention of wresting from him the reason for his interest in Glenarm House and my affairs. "'Not so fast,' I admonished sharply. "'Excuse me,' he replied mockingly. He was no common rogue. I felt the quality in him with a certain admiration for his scoundrelly talents. A fellow, I reflected, who was best studied at the point of a pistol. I continued at his heels, and poked the muzzle of the revolver against his back from time to time, to keep him assured of my presence, a device that I was to regret a second later. We were about ten yards from the end of the corridor, when he flung himself backward upon me, threw his arms over his head, and seized me about the neck, turning himself lightly until his fingers clasped my throat. I fired blindly once, and felt the smoke of the revolver hot in my own nostrils. The lantern fell from my hand, and one or the other of us smashed it with our feet. A wrestling match in that dark hole was not to my liking. I still held on to the revolver, waiting for a chance to use it, and meanwhile he tried to throw me, forcing me back against one side and then the other of the passage. 
With a quick rush, he flung me away, and in the same second I fired. The roar of the shot in the narrow corridor seemed interminable. I flung myself on the floor, expecting a return shot, and quickly enough a flash broke upon the darkness dead ahead, and I rose to my feet, fired again, and leaped to the opposite side of the corridor and crouched there. We had adopted the same tactics, firing and dodging, to avoid the target made by the flash of our pistols, and watching and listening after the roar of the explosions. It was a very pretty game, but destined not to last long. He was slowly retreating toward the end of the passage, where there was, I remembered, a dead wall. His only chance was to crawl through an area window I knew to be there, and this would, I felt sure, give him into my hands. After five shots apiece there was a truce. The pungent smoke of the powder caused me to cough, and he laughed. "'Have you swallowed a bullet, Mr. Glenarm?' he called. I could hear his feet scraping on the cement floor. He was moving away from me, doubtless intending to fire when he reached the area window and escape before I could reach him. I crept warily after him, ready to fire on the instant, but not wishing to throw away my last cartridge. That I resolved to keep for close quarters at the window. He was now very near the end of the corridor. I heard his feet strike some boards that I remembered lay on the floor there, and I was nerved for a shot and a hand-to-hand struggle if it came to that. I was sure that he sought the window. I heard his hands on the wall as he felt for it. Then a breath of cold air swept the passage, and I knew he must be drawing himself up to the opening. I fired and dropped to the floor. With the roar of the explosion, I heard him yell, but the expected return shot did not follow. The pounding of my heart seemed to mark the passing of hours. I feared that my foe was playing some trick, creeping towards me, perhaps, to fire at close range, or to grapple with me in the dark. The cold air still whistled into the corridor, and I began to feel the chill of it. Being fired upon is disagreeable enough, but waiting in the dark for the shot is worse. I rose and walked toward the end of the passage. Then his revolver flashed and roared directly ahead, the flame of it so near that it blinded me. I fell forward confused and stunned, but shook myself together in a moment and got upon my feet. The draft of air no longer blew into the passage. Morgan had taken himself off through the window and closed it after him. I made sure of this by going to the window and feeling of it with my hands. I went back and groped about for my candle, which I found without difficulty and lighted. I then returned to the window and examined the catch. To my utter astonishment it was fastened with staples, driven deep into the sash, in such a way that it could not possibly have been opened without the aid of tools. I tried it at every point. Not only was it securely fastened, but it could not possibly be opened without an expenditure of time and labor. There was no doubt whatever that Morgan knew more about Glenarm House than I did. It was possible, but not likely, that he had crept past me in the corridor and gone out through the house, or by some other cellar window. My eyes were smarting from the smoke of the last shot, and my cheek stung where the burnt powder had struck my face. I was alive, but in my vexation and perplexity not, I fear, grateful for my safety. It was, however, some consolation to feel sure I had winged the enemy. I gathered up the fragments of Morgan's lantern and went back to the library. The lights and half the candlesticks had sputtered out. I extinguished the remainder and started to my room. Then, in the great dark hall, I heard a muffled tread as of someone following me, not on the great staircase, nor in any place I could identify, yet unmistakably on steps of some sort beneath or above me. My nerves were already keyed to a breaking pitch, and the ghost-like tread in the hall angered me. Morgan or his ally Bates, I reflected, at some new trick. I ran into my room, found a heavy walking stick, and set off for Bates's room on the third floor. It was always easy to attribute any sort of mischief to the fellow, and undoubtedly he was crawling through the house somewhere on an errand that boded no good to me. It was now past two o'clock, and he should have been asleep and out of the way long ago. I crept to his room and threw open the door without, I must say, the slightest idea of finding him there. But Bates the enigma, Bates the incomparable cook, the perfect servant, sat at a table, the light of several candles falling on a book, over which he was bent with the maddening gravity he had never yet in my presence thrown off. He rose at once, stood at attention, inclining his head slightly. "'Yes, Mr. Glenarm?' "'Yes, the devil!' I roared at him, 
astonished at finding him, sorry, I must say, that he was there. The stick fell from my hands. I did not doubt he knew perfectly well that I had some purpose in breaking in upon him. I was baffled, and in my rage floundered for words to explain myself. I thought I heard someone in the house. I don't want you prowling about in the night, do you hear? Certainly not, sir, he said in a grieved tone. I glanced at the book he had been reading. It was a volume of Shakespeare's comedies, open at the first scene of the last act of The Winter's Tale. "'Quite a pretty bit of work, that, I should say,' he remarked. "'It was one of my late master's favorites. "'Go to the devil!' I bawled at him, and went down to my room and slammed the door in rage and chagrin. End of chapter 10